Um, so today I want to talk about um, sort of the large trajectory of my work over the past um, 15 years. And I'm going to go back in time a little bit with some early influences. Um, Sarah mentioned that I'm from Detroit. I didn't grow up there, but I've lived my whole life in Michigan. And most of my adult life has been based in the city. Um, and our uh, museum that is a true gem is called the Detroit Institute of Arts. And they have a fabulous uh, 19th century painting collection. So on the screen is a um, painting by Frederick Church called Code Epoxy. And this is a painting that I would look at and respond to over many years. And when I came to Crystal Bridges for the first time a month ago, I walked into your 19th century galleries and I went, oh my gosh, there's some of my old friends, those early influences of the Hudson River School painters who painted nature and the drama of natural phenomena um, that so spoke to me um, way back. This is a, also a painting in the collection of the Detroit Institute of Art. It's um, Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold. And you'll, you'll see a little bit later in my presentation why this um, painting that merges sort of the essence of some sort of atmospheric event or cultural event um, also influenced uh, my depictions of landscape. And then, of course, this painting here um, Asher B. Durand, um, Kindred Spirits, which is here. I saw that and I went, oh my gosh. Um, as well as the Martin Johnson Heads and all the, the depiction of luminism really spoke to me early on uh, as an artist. So I have a couple of quotes I'm going um, to read throughout my presentation. And one um, question that I had as I started to think about my own work. I largely started with just creating works on paper. And, um, but I would look at a painting like this and I would think, okay, so how, how, how has this informed, you know, what we know about nature and culture? Isn't this, um, how, where do we perceive ourselves in the natural environment? And another question that came up for me is, is there a new wilderness that includes human agency both overhead and underfoot? Uh, many of these paintings, especially this one, which has Thomas Cole and I think the poet uh, Bryant um, conversing um, on this rock, are composites. They're not actually painted from the real place. They're composites of an idealized landscape. So these questions about romanticizing nature um, were questions that kept coming up for me, like one that I had was, what, what is the contemporary sublime? Is there a contemporary sublime? And for me, it came from the urban environment. So I started to break down this idea of landscape, and I first started dealing just with air and atmosphere. So these are very early drawings of mine. I started working very realistically, um, and focusing primarily on power plants. This is a power plant in Amsterdam. This is an incinerator in Detroit. And you can see the, if, you, if I were, were to go back and show you that painting of um, church with that luminous orange glow, those influenced how I worked stylistically. And um, I had this fascination with a waste to energy facility right in, the midtown area of where I taught uh, at the art college. And I would see this every day as I would leave to go home. I would look at the stack and I would go, oh, the wind is coming from the west. And I would, I would read the weather and atmosphere based on the plume. And I thought, what a, you know, how interesting. It's like reading your natural en environment. So I continued to make drawings of the incinerator, but focusing more on it as a, um, an indicator of weather and atmosphere. These are some drawings a little bit later during that time period where my work started to get more abstract and I started to look just at cloud formations, um, kind of blurring the distinction of whether they were occurring naturally 
or whether they were created by some sort of ground effect from in industry, which Detroit has, has a lot of, as you know, because it's home to the auto industry. So um, the piece on the right is called Peculiar Weather, and this one is just called um, Cluster. Here are other um, drawings from that time period. And these little marks are actually hand stenciled on, on the paper. And the units themselves are taken from a single um, increment of a pattern on the tail feather of a, of a um, peregrine falcon. And the city has, a, uh, peregrine falcons have been reintroduced <coughs> into the city, which is so stunning to see. They feed on pigeons, they feed on rats. And so that balance of, you know, curbing uh, rodents and things like that, I love how they're reintroduced and they've taken hold on certain buildings and nested. So I started to look at peregrine falcons and one day I was examining feathers and when I started cutting these stencils, I went, oh my gosh, this, that little unit is actually the shape of a bird. So I started thinking also about fractals and self-similar shapes regardless of uh, scale. Um, back to the incinerator and weather. At that time, I started to work with narrative. And this is a piece called 64 Views of the Incinerator. And there are tiny little drawings looking at how that plume of steam would shift with the wind. So from here, I started to, I was still working on paper. This is maybe around 2000, 2002. Um, I was interested in exploring new formats for my work, new ways to tell a story and to go back to some of those qualities that I was thinking about in 19th century painting such as beauty in the sublime and this infinite, vast landscape. And I thought, really, what is the infinite these days? And to me, the infinite is not nature. It is the urban environment. So I reversed in this piece called Between 40 and 60, this idea of the sky being finite and the buildings being infinite. So this is a scroll. These are... Um, hand stenciled, they're um, created with brushed ink on paper, and I wanted to create this feeling that the city would go on forever, um, but the sky is finite. So how I um, worked with these images, in New York I walked from 40th to 60th Street and I stood in the middle of each intersection and photographed the buildings and the spaces in between the buildings. So this is like a, a documentation between um, the city itself, this idea of architecture almost feeling rock-like, um, almost um, thinking with some of these buildings that, like, well, they could be cliffs. So I, I really intentionally um, got rid of the details of the buildings. Whoa. Oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. Let's come back. There we go. Okay. <coughs> Um, so here's another scroll piece that I did, um, and this is called House Weather. And this is now based on actual photographs, and they're, it's printed out on translucent paper, and I started to paint on both sides of the paper because I started to think about how architecture mediates our experience of natural elements and doors and windows, and we are often always viewing external forces through the, that framing device of architecture. It, it's incorporated in our field of vision. Just as those spaces between the buildings in, influenced my work, I started to insert these planes in space um, so that this source of some sort of plume of water or cloud you don't really know what the source is. So it's, it's again, I'm, uh, I was interested in blurring the distinction between um, the built environment and natural forces. I also started to become increasingly um, interested in weather. I gotta stop moving this, sorry. <laughs> It'll come back. Um, so I'm, while this is coming back, I wanna read a quote um, from a catalog that relates to that question I have about wilderness. 
and human agency both overhead and underfoot. And this presentation is starting mainly with atmosphere and weather, and then I'm going to move to the ground plane. Um, there was a, an exhibition I saw a while back in Wyoming called Framing the Wild. And there's an essay in that um, catalog that really resonated with me, and it's by a writer by the name of John Dorst. And he says, virtually by definition, the wild is that which supposedly stands beyond human control, beyond all culturally coded and socially manipulated frames. He continues, the very distinction between wild and not wild is a human convention in the first place. Wildness is a name for the frame we place around things we want to believe are beyond human framing. So the question of the wild started to resonate with me. And I started to think about um, atmosphere and some of the, the plumes, some of the um, auto industry emissions, and how those emissions seamlessly metamorphize with the atmosphere. So um, I, I got a little deeper into the study of air. And I, at this time, this was 2009, I received a very generous fellowship from the Kresge Foundation. Um, and so I was able to expand my practice into um, different realms. And I, for the 2009-2010, um, I bought a webcam. And I set it up on top of the Fisher Building on the 22nd floor right here. I have a friend that has a graphic design business. And he said, you can put it up. It's, it was inside, but there's also this parapet that um, uh, I could go out the window, I could climb out the window, and I could see the city from about a 180 degree viewpoint. So I started to record the weather, and the camera took a picture every minute, 24 hours a day for one year. Still images, click, click, click. And when I amassed all this information and images, I compressed them into a video that ran for three hours. So what I was able to see was, um, weather and industry affecting one another. And I'll show you that still in just a minute, but one thing I want to say is this building is an Albert Kahn building, and it mirrors sort of the cliffs um, in the southwest, and peregrines nest on here and because it's sort of stepped. And so if I would go out here often, I would be dive-bombed by peregrine falcons because they, they would nest on here, and it was very scary, I have to say. They owned it. Um, so here is um, a snippet of the view of Detroit from uh, looking south. And there is downtown Detroit. And this is a snippet of the weather video, which doesn't want to go now. Let's see. Um, so you can see. Um, hmm. Enter. Nope. You know what? I may have to reload it. Um, let's see if this one will go, because I don't think I ran this one. Sorry, guys. Yeah, these are really pretty spectacular to watch. No. There we go. Okay, so here, um, this is sort of pixelated. So here you're looking at southwest Detroit. This is a steel smelter right there. And that is Zug Island. Uh, this is Zug Island. That's Canada right there. And to the right is the Ford Rouge plant, where Ford has um, its production. So you see this sort of brownish ochre color. That coloration in the sky was of great interest to me in terms of pollutants and what those were. Um, and what was great is this. Um, video right here. I worked with a meteorologist um, and showed them snippets of this and they got so excited because they said, oh my gosh, that's a fumulus cloud. That is the um, result of the heat and torque from a stack holding um, a cloud overhead. And here's a, here's a still image of that. So that one on the upper right is the result, of, that cloud stayed in place for quite a while mm -hmm. because of that, um, the, the emissions there. So that become, became very interesting to me. 
all the stuff that I discovered embedded in the video. So that um, got me deeper into air and the science of air. And from here, I went and worked with um, meteorologists. I'm showing you this picture of a, a, a Turner painting because um, not only was Turner an influence on my work early on, but um, I considered some of my work to be an extension of what he was doing in 1842, where he, he started to look at abstract forces, wind, speed, and direction. And he um, started to work with things that you can't really see, but you can feel. And so in my, um, my research with the um, whoops, meteorologists, I started to think, what is the, what is the new um, update for this, for abstract thinking, for you know, how we experience weather? And I got into working with people that actually measure daily the, um, the weather by means of weather balloons. So I would attend these weather balloon launches, which happen all over the world twice a day based on the Greenwich clock. So these are some of the places that I went. And I, there's something very poetic about how data is retrieved. The balloon goes up. It's got a little box. There's a, a GPS that tracks it. And all that data and information is reported back to uh, the ground. And these are some of the, their um, informational charts that they work from. This, again, is um, an upper air sounding. And as the balloon goes up before it bursts at about 3,600 feet, um, this is what that graph looks like. So I started to incorporate some of this information into my woodblock prints. And trying to get to this idea of working with something invisible, this is printed. And these are holes that are actually punched. And it's, uh, these are called winds aloft. So um, here's the, the, the holes in the paper are physical. Here's a, just a pile of holes left over from when I manually punched those by hand. Here's another one. Um, and again, it's more about movement, about air. Um, all of these are based on, on real events, but they're very abstract. And so it's taking data and information and using that to make, to sort of throw it back on itself and go, okay, how do I represent this visually? Um, and these little hooks and lines, they denote wind speed and direction. So I actually, I would show this to a, a meteorologist and they would say, oh, there's an inversion, which just totally fascinated me that they could read these as real information. So then I started to go back to this idea of landscape, and I re reinserted the data and information based on those scientists' um, charts into the landscape. So I was interested, again, in blurring that distinction between information and atmosphere and phenomenology going back to the church painting of this sort of drama. So I looked at data and information as actual weather events. So these are actually charts, but I find some gesture in them that speaks about the thing itself. So I reinserted them back into um, the landscape. I'm going to move to the ground now. So those are all woodblock prints, and all the white areas are hand-punched holes. So they're, they're really a um, cross between a print and a drawing. So the background is printed from wood, and then the white part is, is more like a drawing. So here comes the sun, oh goody. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I, from, this, from the, the prints that I was doing with the weather, I started just to focus on the ground plane and the geometry of flying overhead and looking at the geometry of, this, of cities. And uh, these are called aerials, um, other cities. And they're from cities ar um, around the country. Um, many of them are based on Detroit. For example, this one um, is based on the East Coast, sort of flying off over the Atlantic and going up the coastline. But I let the wood tell me what to do. Like, there's this beautiful grain pattern in wood. And I don't really know what the landscape is going to be until I ink up the wood and I do these tonal gradations. Um, so I let that suggest something. I let the wood speak to me. 
and um, uh, here's another one. So you can see the wood grain in here. And it, this is, these are very difficult to understand the physical nature of them, that these are holes in the paper. Um, these are really long prints. This one is based on LA, and this one is, I think, based on the East Coast. Again, they're based on composites. Some, some of them are not real places. Um, this one is based on a real place in Pittsburgh where I did a, a project, and um, they installed a webcam. Um, and this, this little cloud formation, believe it or not, there's little dips in the wood, so if, I, if this was a piece of wood and I were to roll ink over the surface, I play with the imperfections in it. It doesn't always pick up the ink in a uniform manner, and it, it creates a sort of atmosphere. So you, you probably know this artist's work. You've got one right out in front, Roxy Payne. Um, it'll come back. I'll learn, won't I? Um, so I'm, there's a quote by um, Ken Johnson who reviewed Roxy Payne's work. Um, and that, that image that you saw, and I'll show you detail in just a second. Um, he says there is a larger idea animating his work, that human culture is inextricably part of nature. The pieces of the trees attached to the plumbing. And it's not that evident in the, um, the images. Of course, right here it's not evident at all. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. All right, you might be, see it, but you know he, he reveals all the welds and everything. It's all very honest, the way that he um, creates these. Um, so Mr. Payne emphasizes tension between natural and artificial by leaving welded joints unfinished. If you follow Mr. Payne's logic, you approach the idea that human culture is as much a part of nature as mountain trees and animals. And then he says, nothing is unnatural. That, that comment really resonates with me and where my work has gone. Um, back to that question about where are we in those paintings um, that the Hudson River School um, did, where we're regarding nature out there, this vast um, horizon. Where are we in that painting? Um, so I started to look at the built environment again and wanting to immerse myself in my, the physical aspect of this. So here, you've probably all seen this somewhere. In fact, Sarah, this is the fence I thought you were installing. This <laughs> Sarah was telling me about a fence she's installing. Um, so this is um, a tree that has grown right through this fence. And that is uh, amazing to me. It's survived. It's picked up the patterning. Mm -hmm. But it's metaphoric for, for my thinking of how nature, culture, it's so um, in, in, entwined with one another that you have, to, you have to look at it from that point, where we are now. Um, and if you took this fence down, the tree would come down. If you took the tree down, the fence would come down. So there's this sort of symbiotic relationship that is happening here. They both... Um, they're married together. And that um, became the impetus for the works that you'll, you can see upstairs. I started to think about the ability of nature to adapt to forms. And being trained as a printmaker, my process is informed very much by transference, by um, looking at how one thing um, affects another. And so I started to think about consumer culture and all the vacuum form plastics that we have um, for everything we consume. And we just accept we have these things. And the um, artist who was here yesterday, we had such a great conversation. Pam, um, what's her last name? Longo Barty. And she w collects plastics. You've probably seen her work. It's fantastic. And I actually work um, indirectly with plastics. So I use them as molds. I grow grass. And once the roots of the grass become um, root-bound like this, I unearth them and I make these carpets based on uh, these textures. So what I have here at Crystal Bridges are the individual units. They're very culturally specific. And here's how I put, start to put them together. Um, so this shape right here is... Um, earthbound farm lettuces. 
You can buy your lettuce in containers, and they have these sort of waffly bottoms. And I don't know if they have them here. I think it's a pretty national, you know, company. The other, this container here on the right is from Girl Scout Cookies Tagalongs. And so I'm interested in that idea of when does the object become a field? When does it lose its identity? Sort of like those buildings that I showed you. They're, when you see them in mass, not one stands out. It becomes a whole field. So there's the Tagalongs. There's the, the lettuce containers. And those are dried. Uh, when I show these works, I dry them at different stages and try to preserve the green. So then it also reflects time, it reflects the seasons, and it reflects change. This is an installation at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. There's some of the prints installed in the same gallery. Which brings me now to working directly with seasonals. And, uh, then I'm going to just show you one more body of work. So it, in the process of wanting to engage more with seasons and landscape, I started collecting. Every season I would collect something. I mean, just as simple as picking up a stick or, or a leaf. And I especially like leaves with holes in them. So this is a burdock, and I put them in these large light boxes. So these are really basically herbariums. And here's another. This is called the Book of Leaves, and there's another one called the Book of Clouds. So every season I will step outside into the parking lot near my studio and I'll go, okay, what's happening out here? It's pretty boring. It's asphalt. There's a few trees that hang over. In the spring, there are these cottonwood trees. And the, I mean, I don't know if you have them here. You, do you have cottonwood trees here? Yeah. And so it's like it's snowing and it just lines the periphery of the building. And I, so I thought, oh, I need to celebrate this somehow. I need to mark this and remember it. So I started to to um, collect the um, cottonwood. So there's like sort of spray mount in the middle of that paper, and that's how it, I would get it to stay on the page. We had a mulberry tree that would hang over the parking lot. Somebody had this old, old um, Mercedes that was, didn't work anymore. It was parked there um, for about a year. And it had a, a sort of a off-white patina. It was parked under the tree. You, well, when the mulberries start to drop, can you? I wish I would have documented the car instead of this. But the mulberries, there's spaces you just cannot park there because they, they, they'll just totally destroy anything that's there. So one day I thought, you know, I wonder if it's true that you could bake a pie. Um, and so I put, I put pie shells out here, and it was, it was really hot you know, explosive spring, summer, it got hot really fast. So I put the pie shells out just to see how long it would take to fill the pies, and then just to see if they would transform, or I don't know what I thought. It was just an experiment. I used par the parking lot as so somewhat of a laboratory. Um, so I got, it was happening rather slowly, so I started to shovel the pie.